Turkana tribes people fleeing from the worst drought in living memory. With famine declared in Somalia, the world has watched as refugees escape across the border into Kenya. This is a region-wide crisis, one where global forces intersect. And just weeks before world leaders meet to discuss climate policy in Durban, fault lines travel through the Horn of Africa to find out what's at stake as changing weather patterns and hunger threaten 13 million lives. The Turkana of northern Kenya have always been nomads, but the changes are making them refugees in their own lands, and everyone we meet seems afraid. The place this family has escaped from is where Fault Lines is heading, along a road lined with stories about a way of life coming to an end. The Turkana are pastoral farmers, and keeping livestock alive is fundamental to daily survival. We've just seen another group of young men sitting on the top of this hill carrying a weapon. It seems like it's something we're seeing increasingly as we get closer to Todonyang and the border area, where we've heard that security has become a real problem as resources dry up and tribes fight with each other over the resources that remain. The Akasukut family has been walking for days they left Todon Yang after their herd of 400 animals had shrunk to just five. They say the drought has left them dependent on aid and turned their home into a ghost town and a graveyard. Tribal elder James Merry used to be a rich man before his community fled Toronyang after a wave of killings by an Ethiopian tribe the Turkana called Merile. They established a new homestead, but his herd of 900 goats now numbers just 55. And he's fearful of what future awaits Ikiru, his son. <laughs> We're traveling under the protection of Todon Yang's tribal chiefs. They tell us enemies of the Turkana are all around us. So the enemy is still close. Conflict has worsened as rival tribes compete for increasingly scarce resources. In Toronyang, massacres have taken place twice this year. The Kenyan government has had to send in armed troops. So these guys are going to take us to the town where everyone's had to leave because of the attacks and the lack of security. You can see the soldiers just over my shoulder here. This is a place where the security presence has really been ramped up over the past couple of months because of attacks across the border from cattle raiders. There's no question that resources are disappearing. Over the past 40 years, greenhouse gas emissions have raised global temperatures by almost one degree Celsius. Weather patterns have changed too. Since the 70s, rainfall in Kenya has declined by more than 100 millimeters a year and is increasingly unpredictable. Pasture is scarce during droughts, which come more frequently. And even the waters of Lake Turkana are receding. In Todonyang, it's having fatal consequences. After the massacre, they all left this village and those with uh, those who had animals mm -hmm. to to keep here for, for
for pasture. Mm. Uh, lived in the homestead that we are going now. Okay. It's an eerie scene. Homes abandoned and reminders of death everywhere you look. Littered around this entire area are the bones of livestock that have been killed by the drought over the past few months. And just over there on the horizon, that patch of green is where the Marilla tribe are hiding. The Todonyang chiefs have told us that that's where the majority of the Turkana around here have been killed by cattle raiders coming across the border. For several years, we've got conflicts between the Turkana people with the Toposas from Sudan, with the, the, the Karamojong from Uganda, from the Merile from Ethiopia. And all this is because of dry spells. Everybody, when, when the Merile's get dry spells in their country, they move to Kenya, to the Turkana land. Amongst the animal bones are the human graves of those who've died, a toll that's rising as the drought intensifies. You can actually see how much worse the progression has got over the years, with one or two bodies killed in 2002, 2003 per year as a result of cattle raids. And as the drought really started to hit Kenya, this grave here of 28 and the other one there of 13 are all people killed in the past six months as the Turkana are forced to go further afield to search for fresh pasture for their animals. But as they scan the horizon for signs of the Marille, the chiefs say they've been overtaken by an even more powerful enemy. The droughts have contributed to this. In the last two years, we had a lot of, a lot of drought uh, within our country. So when, when drought comes, Turkanas go scattered everywhere to look for green pastures and water. And uh, the few that came to the lake to look for the greener pastures and water were, were captured and killed. And that is that. It's not just in the arid lands that Kenyans are living on the edge. This is Kibera. We've been taken into one of the poorest areas of one of the biggest slums in Nairobi. This is a place where people live on less than one dollar a day, most of the residents of this neighborhood. Home to almost 200,000 people, malnutrition rates are rising. This one. And hunger is being exacerbated by changes in a different kind of environment. The market. Yes. Last month it was 3,500. Yes. So that means it's more than doubled in yes. one month. Yes. Yeah. The price of sugar. Mm. Wow. Halima Bodana is struggling to provide for her granddaughter, 16 year old Nasibo. In the space of just a few months, Halima says the prices she's paying for rice and sugar have more than doubled. <laughs> In a neighborhood where more than 50% of residents are unemployed, Halima's difficulties are common. As the price of basic food items spirals out of reach. Food markets are impacted by uh, droughts and floods. Uh, they are impacted by um, the price of oil. There are many factors that uh, result in the prices of food evolving over time. But over the past five or six years, the volatility has been significantly higher than in the past as a result of speculation. As the UN's food security expert explains, commodities markets like the Chicago Mercantile Exchange used to help food producers hedge against risk, allowing them to buy and sell goods like maize at predictable prices. Then, a decade ago, the US deregulated the markets. 
and let investment banks and hedge funds in on the action. The logic was not anymore linked to the real economy of supply and demand. The logic became a purely gambling logic, a purely financial uh, logic, in which uh, traders follow what others do in a herding behavior that really accelerates the bubbles uh, forming and the bubbles exploding and, and increasing the volatility uh, on the market. So you think this has a real impact in local markets, in places like Kibera in Nairobi, they actually feel those effects? They have a direct impact, especially since many low-income countries import much of the food that they consume. As the price of staples soars, in downtown Nairobi, the reaction is taking shape on the streets. The Kenyan revolution is on. Every Kenyan right to petition the government through demonstration, picketing and assembling. That's why we're here as members of the Unga revolution to make sure that we put the government on task on their responsibility to feed Kenyans. This group is known as the Unga revolution movement named after the key Swahili word for maize flour. In Kenya, unga is a, the maize flour used to make ugali. And you know, unga is the staple food for this country. And when the staple food becomes out of reach of many people, then people are suffering. We have been spurred by the Arab Spring. Because uh, in Tunisia it was about food and unemployment, in Egypt the same about bread, in Kenya it's about unga. The protesters are calling on the Kenyan government to bring in price controls and subsidies, but the government has refused. And if needs be, we are going to mobilize Kenyans into a popular revolution, because if our government cannot, cannot listen to us, then we have no option. A government that cannot feed its people has got no business being in power. The Unga revolutionaries are now on their way to the main bus terminal in Nairobi to try to find more people to participate in the demonstration bringing traffic to a standstill. A large crowd soon gathers. I think there is a now a sense that things cannot go on. People are becoming impatient. It is simply not acceptable that the poor in, in, in Kenya uh, have a price increase of 100% simply because of the way that the, the traders on the Chicago uh, Board of Trade exchange uh, futures on, on commodities. The U.S. has some of the largest commodity exchanges in the world. And in the wake of the global financial meltdown, the U.S. Congress passed a law that gave Bart Chilton's commission the power to regulate them in an effort to stop speculation. We're not price setters in this agency. We don't control the price of food. But damned if we shouldn't make sure that these markets are free and fair and the prices are based upon supply and demand not some money speculator who's trying to make a profit on people's backs. But writing the new rules has been slow. Lobbyists for financial institutions have resisted regulation. Uh, there's an old saying in Washington and that if you're not part of the solution, there's plenty of money to be made being part of the problem. Uh, we've got a lot of lawyers in town, a lot of lobbyists, and uh, some of them don't want to have the apple cart upset. When anger and unrest flared around the world as food prices spiked in 2008, it was a warning sign for the United States, and not just for financial regulators. You know, the consequences of a global system where you have global food shortages uh, is very dire. In 2009, the newly elected Obama administration launched a multi-billion dollar initiative it calls Feed the Future. It's a longer-term solution to hunger than the $650 million worth of aid the U.S. has given to the regional relief effort. And at the U.S. Embassy in Nairobi, the Deputy Chief of Mission tells us about the food security program they're spotlighting as drought intensifies in the Horn of Africa and famine hits Somalia. So we feel that this is something that's very much in the U.S. national interest, uh, the soft diplomacy, soft security side. Feed the Future is destined to reach 20 countries on three continents. But the first seeds have been planted here in Kenya. The US Agency for International Development, or USAID, is in charge, and they took us on a tour.
The semi-arid eastern province is one of two regions where Feed the Future is focused in Kenya. So we decided that we would focus our efforts in those two areas, but specifically on you know, seeds, fertilizer, technology, land management, uh, and regulatory structures. USAID's partners are cultivating new habits among small-scale farmers who typically rely on maize to survive. They're encouraging them to diversify their crops with cassava and sweet potato and plant specially bred drought-tolerant seeds. We create awareness, farmers start wanting it. Right. And, then, and then when the farmers demand it in the local agro-dealer, right. the agro-dealer demands it from the company and the company says, ah, it's worth my while delivering right, there now. Right. USAID contractor David Priest promotes seeds that have been licensed by private companies, selling small quantities to farmers who test their yield. We are developing the role of seed companies. Some of them are Kenyan companies. We also work with uh, three or four or five international seed companies, uh, one international fertilizer company, and we see them as partners. That's good, huh? Thank you. The model won't work in parts of the country worst affected by drought. But the idea is that developing supply chains of seeds, fertilizer and irrigation technologies will provide food for the region and open up new markets. Uh, the focus of what, we, what we're doing is really to sort of provide those supply chains to attack behavioral um, norms, which will then lead to greater opportunities for the private sector to come in. But some Kenyan farmers disagree with Feed the Future's strategy. So this is a cassava. Evans Mungai is an agroecologist who works with a farmers collective in the central province an area with more plentiful but increasingly unpredictable rainfall. When there's no maize, mm. people tend to think that there's uh, hunger. Mm. But we want uh, the community to come up with alternative solution, promoting their own indigenous foods and uh, consuming them as well as marketing them. But you think that can be done naturally? At first, this approach to food security seems to have a lot in common with USAIDs encouraging farmers to diversify and plant crops suited to a warming climate. But there are important differences. The farmers here grow food organically without the use of chemical fertilizers. You minimize the cost of production, so the farmer will have good returns. Uh, secondly, you use what is locally available, so you don't have to, to depend on the, uh, uh, external uh, inputs. <laughs> and that's the other crucial difference. Here the farmers are opposed to the commercialization of seed stocks. They want to, to keep away from this habit of, uh, you know, depending on multinational companies on issues to do with seeds. Because we believe that uh, whoever controls the seeds controls the lives of the people. Staving off hunger, Kenyan farmers may find it hard to resist the advances of multinational companies that promise solutions to the effects of climate change. But travelling back into the arid lands in Kenya's northeast, it's hard to put off questions about causes and accountability. For decades, the major emitters of greenhouse gases have been industrialised nations in the West. Developing economies like India may be catching up fast, but the United States still emits more carbon dioxide than any other country apart from China, and more per capita than any other major economy. The Obama administration readily admits that climate change is at the heart of what's happening here. We know that climate change is having an enormous impact and will continue to have an enormous impact on development. When you look at the Horn, uh, the worst drought in 60 years uh, is, not, is not insignificant. It's had a huge impact and it's likely that we're going to see more of this. I know very well that the, the international community is very aware uh, about the causes of, of, of uh, the, the current crisis we're going through. As we work on food security, uh, investments in economic growth and strengthening regional markets, including agricultural markets, we're also working on the things that need to be done on the climate side of the equation to help on adaptation. Uh, but the international community prefers to treat the symptoms other than the cause of, 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 of the, the, the problem. The Kyoto Protocol, the only legally binding treaty requiring developed countries to cut carbon emissions, expires next year. 
the US never ratified it to begin with, won't consider a binding agreement before 2020, and then only if it includes China. So African leaders aren't holding out hope for a deal that could keep global temperatures from continuing to rise. The attitude we saw in Copenhagen and also in Cancun uh, was not very uh, encouraging in the sense that um, the major uh, developed economies um, are not really willing to take drastic steps that would help to reduce the emissions. In Ijara's pastoralist communities, there's a greater sense of urgency. Here, they've already made efforts to adapt to long and more frequent droughts. With the support of NGOs Womankind and ActionAid, this group of women have pooled their resources and transformed their goat herds into a cash business. Their entrepreneurship has helped them weather this dry spell. But their business is faltering. The NGOs have helped them build water pans to collect in frequent rains. The women bring the goats to drink and the children fetch water for their families. But their efforts to adapt to the harsh consequences of climate change haven't been enough. In spite of all their work, they know the forces they're confronting lie far beyond their control in industrialized countries whose carbon footprint is exponentially higher than that of pastoralist societies. Whatsoever they did to the environment is what is causing us now the problem. As the nominated member of parliament for Ajara, Sophia Abdi Noor knows her community is paying a high price for decades of fossil fuel development elsewhere. They are developing at our own expense. They are doing all sorts of things at our own expense. So whatsoever they are doing at their places and benefiting from the outputs they are making is what is affecting us as a society in Africa. <laughs> Does she think people in the West realised this? For Sophia, the drought is a final warning to world leaders discussing the future of global climate policy in Durban. And as she contemplates a precarious future for the people of the arid lands, she has a message for one delegation in particular. I'm very much disappointed with the, the President of United States of America, Barack Obama. We, the world all over, had a lot of hope in him. We had a lot of expectation in him. We want him to take the lead in trying when they're coming for Durban and for once for him to stand up for the interests of the world, not their own interests.